everyone! So, in this video, I'll be discussing Title 10 or Crimes Against Property, still in Book 2 of the Revised Penal Code. So, this is a pretty long discussion and it, it includes um, Articles 293 to 332. So, let's begin. Chapter 1 is Robbery in General and Section 1 is Robbery with Violence or Intimidation of Persons. So, Articles 293 to 305 discusses robbery. So who are guilty of robbery? Robbery is committed by any person who, with intent to gain, shall take any property belonging to another by means of violence against or intimidation of any person or using force upon anything. So the elements of robbery includes that the offender unlawfully takes a personal property, that the said personal property belongs to another person, that there must be an intent to gain in the taking of the personal property, and that the said taking is either by means of violence against or intimidation upon any person or using force upon anything. So what is unlawful taking? Unlawful taking is the deprivation of the offended party of his personal property with an element of permanency. So it is necessary that in taking the personal property from another person, there is an element of permanency. The law requires that the property must be personal property and not real property because if it is real property, it might be under Article 312 or Occupation of Real Property. So the personal property must belong to another person because if it does not belong to another person, it cannot be said that there is intent to gain on the part of the offender. So kung wari, um, alam mong sa'yo yung watch na, yun, watch na yun. Tapos, in-intimidate mo siya na isoli yung watch na yun. So, is this robbery? So, no. It may be grave coercion. So, intent to gain is an internal state of mind. So, how can you prove intent to gain? The law presumes that there is intent to gain the moment there is taking of personal property of another person. So, yung intent to gain daw, it is presumed by law. So, there are two ways of committing robbery. One is... Um, robbery with violence against or intimidation of any person. And another is robbery with the use of force upon things. So the value of the property taken in robbery, um, robbery with violence against or intimidation against people is immaterial because the penalty is dependent on the violence used by the offender against the offended party. However, in robbery with the use of force upon things, the value of the property taken is, the, is material because the, the penalty of the, is dependent on the value of the property taken. So when is robbery complex? So itong mga to po, uh, these are complex crimes. So first, we have robbery with homicide. So robbery with homicide is a special complex crime or a composite crime, or a single indivisible offense. So, hindi ito under Article 48 because it um, it provides for its own penalty. So, in reality, two or more crimes have been committed, the robbery and the homicide, yet in the eyes of the law, only one crime, a single indivisible offense of robbery with homicide. So, when should the killing of, uh, when should the killing or the homicide take place in the said robbery. So in case of robbery of the homicide, for as long as the original intent, intent of the offender uh, was to rob or to commit robbery, the killing may take place before, uh, during, or after the said robbery. Basta yung original intent niya is magnakaw ng may use ng violence. Since it is a special complex crime, regardless of the number of the persons killed, there is only a single indivisible offense of robbery with homicide. Even if the killing is unintentional killing or accidental killing, still, it is a single indivisible offense of robbery with homicide. Even if the victim of the said robbery is different from the victim of the killing, so for example, kahit nga yung offender yung mamatay, as long as it is incidental to the, to the robbery, um, it is still robbery with homicide. So, it differentiate natin siya dun sa Article 267. It was discussed in another video. So, it's um, serious legal detention. Uh, so, here, there is single, uh, um, sorry, serious illegal detention with homicide. Doon kasi kailangan yung victim mismo yung mamatay. It said there that it is necessary that it is the victim who died for it to be serious illegal detention with homicide. But here in robbery with homicide, it is not necessary na yung victim yung namatay as long as may namatay na incidental dun sa robbery and connected siya dun sa robbery. So 
um, for example, yung offender yung namatay, it is still uh, it is still the complex crime of robbery with homicide. So another is robbery with rape. Just like robbery with homicide, it is also a special complex crime. So single indivisible offense din siya. So for as long as the intention of the criminal is to um, rob the person, rape may be committed during or after the commission of the robbery. So since single ano siya, since special complex crime siya, regardless of the number of times na na-rape yung victim or regardless of the uh, number of victims that were raped, it is still robbery. It is still the single indivisible offense of robbery with rape. There is no such crime as robbery with multiple rape. There is only robbery with rape. And lastly, robbery with intentional mutilation arson, and serious physical injuries. So here naman, ganun pa rin. For as long as the intent of or the criminal design of the offender is to commit robbery, the intentional mutilation, arson, or serious physical injuries uh, may be committed before, during, or after the commission of the said robbery. And it will still fall to be a special complex crime. So what are the three ways of committing robbery with the use of force upon things? So one is when a person enters the dwelling, house, public building, or edifice devoted to worship where personal property is taken through an opening not intended for entrance or egress. So mga bintana, ganyan. By breaking any wall, roof, or floor, or breaking any door or window. By using false keys, pick locks, or similar tools. By using any fictitious name or pretending the exercise of public authority. So under the first app, the essence of the crime is in the unlawful entry. It is the act of trespass and also the taking of the property of another. So it is necessary that the entire body must have entered. Otherwise, even if there is breaking, it would only amount to theft and the breaking would amount would amount only to an aggravating circumstance. So sabi kasi nila, for example, you um you broke the window and yung thief nakuha lang niya is yung bag na nandun malapit sa window. So, hindi pumasok yung buong katawan niya. So, is this robbery or theft? So, it is said to be theft. Pero, as soon as pumasok yung buong katawan niya, tapos kinuha niya yung bag, tapos yung mga gamit doon, it is already robbery. So, it is important that the whole body is inside. So, another is when the offender manages to enter said inhabited place, dwelling, public place, or place dedicated to religious worship without any unlawful entry or is an insider and once inside, he used force in opening in order to break doors, wardrobes, chest, or any other kind of locked or sealed furniture or receptacle. So the second act is yung offender, pumasok nga, pum nakapasok nga siya or insider siya. And binuksan niya yung mga wardrobes kasi usually dito nakatago yung cash or yung jewelries or yung other um, things of values. So the third one naman, is when the offender manages to enter said inhabited place, dwelling, public place, or place dedicated to religious worship without any unlawful entry once inside, he took the sealed receptacle outside to be opened or forced open. So the offender here na naman was able to go inside pa rin, pero instead na pinirate niya sa loob nung bahay or nung dwelling yung para makakuha ng gamit, nilabas niya yung buong cabinet or nilabas niya yung buong jewelry box for example. So, next is, what are the circumstances that will qualify robbery with the use of force upon things? So, in Article 300, robbery in an inhabited place and by a band. So, dito, if robbery is committed with or in an inhabited place and by a band, so note na yung ginagamit na conjunction ng law is end. So, both has to be present. So, kailangan in uninhabited place and by a band. Both must concur in order to amount to a qualifying circumstance to increase the penalty. So it should be an inhabited place and by a ban. Therefore, both must be present. So in Article 295, um, robbery with physical injuries committed in an inhabited place and by a ban or with the use of, an, of a firearm on a street, road, or alley, in case of robbery with serious physical injuries, unnecessary violence, or simple violence. So, paano naman ma-qualify yung crime dito? So, in Article 295, when it is committed in an inhabited place or by a ban, di ba kanina? And here naman, if it is committed in an inhabited place or by a ban, so yung conjunction dito is or, so it's either. 
by attacking any moving train, streetcar, motor vehicle, or airship, by entering the passengers' compartments in a train, or taking the passengers by surprise in their respective conveyances on a street, road, highway, or alley, and in intimidation, if the intimidation is made use of a firearm. So that in case of robbery with violence or intimidation of persons, the qualifying circumstances are present, only one of these sufficient to qualify the penalty. So the law here uses the conjunction or and not and. So another another to take note of is, for example, um, na hold up ka. So, tinuduhan ka ng barel. So, there is intimidation. Is this robbery or theft? So, of course, it's robbery. Pero, pag nasnatchan ka lang daw, so, for example, uh, hindi mo naramdaman na hablot yung bag mo. It's only theft. Pero, as soon as, for example, para mahablot yung bag mo, tinulak ka nung, tinulak ka nung offender, tapos tumakbo siya. So, sabi nila, robbery na yun. Kasi, may violence na. So, here's an example. So that's what if, sorry, typo. What if A went to the house of B, A told B, hold up to, labas nyo lahat ng alahas nyo, tsaka yung pera nyo. So instead of bringing them, si B nagpanik, tas humigaw siya. Tapos, si A, binaril niya si B, and namatay si B. Tapos si A, nagpanik din siya, ta hindi niya nadala yung mga nanakaw niya. So what crime here is committed? So the crime here um, is attempted robbery with homicide. This is also a special complex crime. Here, robbery was attempted because he wasn't able to take any of the property. The fact that A wasn't able to, uh, to was able to announce yung hold up, um, it already it already says that yung original design niya is to commit robbery. It was attempted because he wasn't unable to take any of the property. So yung in the course naman na patay niya yung si B. So in order to amount to a special complex crime, it is necessary that both the robbery and the homicide must be consummated. What if in the course of the robbery, the said owner was able to survive? So ano ba to? Attempted, uh, attempted homicide or frustrated homicide. So the crime committed is robbery with physical injuries, depending on the injury sustained by the victim. In order to amount to robbery with homicide, it is necessary that both crimes must be present and there is no such thing as frustrated ho as robbery with frustrated homicide or attempted homicide for it is the law which provides for the crime which must be complex and the law does not provide that frustrated homicide or attempted homicide must be complex with robbery so in the instant case since the killing took place at the spur of the moment then it is robbery with homicide so we move on so articles 306 to 307 uh, discusses brigandage. So under Article 306, it is committed by at least four armed men for the purpose of one, committing robbery in the highway. Number two, kidnapping persons for the purpose of extortion or ransom. And third, for any other purpose to be attained by means of force and violence. And in PD uh, 532, and um Define din yung brigandage. So there, in PD 53, in Presidential Decree 5, Decree 532, brigandage is defined as the seizure of any person for ransom, extortion, or other unlawful purposes, or the taking away of property of another by means of violence against or intimidation of persons or force of upon things or uh, or other unlawful means committed by any person on any Philippine highway. So ano yung difference ng brigandage in Article 306? and brigandage in PD 532. So in ano, in Article 306, it requires that there must be at least four armed men, like I said a while ago. In PD 532, there is no requisites as to the number of perpetrators of the crime. Even a single person can commit the crime of brigandage in PD 532. So in Article 306, the mere formation of the band of robbers, kasi ba, pinorm talaga sila to be a band of robbers, for any of the purposes mentioned here in the screen, uh, will bring about the crime already. While in PD 532, there must be an actual commission of the crime or no crime will arise. Then in Article 306, there is a predetermined or preconceived conceived victim. So meron na talaga silang target. While in PD 532, there is no preconceived victim. It is committed indiscriminately on any person passing on the highway as long as it is committed in a Philippine highway. 
So, yan po yung mga differences nila. Uh, remember in Brigadition Article 306, this, uh, they were formed specifically to be a band of robbers uh, committing any of these uh, mentioned in the screen. Oh, ito pala yung difference niya. I'm sorry. Meron pala tayo. So, we go now to theft. Articles 308 to Article 311 discusses theft. So, Article 308. So, who are liable for theft? So, theft is committed by any person who, with intent to gain, but without violence against or intimidation of persons, nor force upon things, shall take another another person's personal property or without, love, without the latter's consent. So theft is likewise committed by any person who, having found lost property, shall fail to deliver the same to the local authorities or its owner. So pag may nahanap ka, tas hindi mo nasole or nadala sa, sa local authorities. Any person who, after having maliciously damaged the property of another, shall um, remove or make use of the fruits of, or objects of, of the damage caused by him. And any person who shall enter an enclosed estate or a field where trespass is forbidden or which belongs to another and without the consent of its owner shall hunt or fish upon the same or shall gather cereals or other forest or farm products. So yung mag-trespass ka tapos mag-harvest mag, uh, mag ka ng kumwari sa farm ng puro manga. So that's still theft. The definition is almost the same as robbery. The difference lies in the case of robbery where there is violence or intimidation of persons and use of, and use of force upon things. While in theft, there is no violence, intimidation against persons or force upon things. Like what I said a while ago, diba? Yung sa pag hinoldap ka, there is intimidation because um, you are intimidated to parang papatayin kita or something like that. While in theft naman, uh, pwede namang nasalisihan ka lang or nasnatchan ka without the use of violence. So in Valenzuela versus People, sabi dun na there is no crime such as frustrated theft. So there is only a attempted theft and um, consummated theft. Because in this case, the offender took boxes of tight from SM North EDSA and placed it in the taxi. So before they were able to left the premises of F SM, they were already apprehended na huli sila ng guard. So the offenders were charged of consummated theft. They did not deny that they, they committed theft, but their defense is that they committed frustrated theft. So yung Supreme Court ruled in this case na um, there is no crime as frustrated theft. In case of theft, unlawful taking is deemed complete the moment the offender gained possession of the property of another. So, na consummate na yung theft. Unlike kanina, di ba, sa robbery, there is frustrated robbery and attempted robbery. So, here, it's only attempted theft or consummated theft. So, next is, when is theft qualified? So, here are the circumstances that qualifies theft. So remember that if theft is committed by a domestic servant, if it is committed by with grave abuse of confidence, if the property stolen is a motor vehicle, mail matter, or large cattle, if the property stolen consists of coconuts taken from the premises of the plantation, and if the property stolen is taken from a fish pond or fishery, and if the property taken on occasion of a fire, earthquake, typhoon, volcanic eruption, or any other calamity, vehicular accident, or civil disturbance. So these are the circumstances that qualifies the penalty of them. So we now have the problem. A was a security guard. Um, the owner A was a security guard. So the owner of the house left his key to this to A, the security guard. However, the security guard used the key to open the house of the owner and took valuables. So ano yung crime na nakomit dito ni, ni A? So the security guard is liable for qualified theft because there is grave abuse of confidence kasi pinagkatiwala sa kanya yung susi tapos ginamit niya yun in order to steal. So next is A is a domestic servant. When his master B was out of the house, A went to B's bedroom and took the jewelries. In the information cited that he was a domestic servant but the information did not state that A took the jewelries with grave abuse grave abuse of confidence. So, liable pa rin ba si uh, A for qualified theft kahit hindi naman stinito na sa information na there is abuse of confidence. Pero sinabi na domestic servant siya. So, yes. Kasi according to the Supreme Court, the law uses the conjunction 
or so the fact that the accused na nakala, nakalagay naman doon as domestic servant siya it will already suffice and it will already quali- qualify theft and um the requirement that of abuse of confidence hindi naman na kailangan ma-establish so next is RA6539 or anti carnapping act so carnapping ano ba to Carnapping is the act, the taking with the intent to gain of motor vehicle belonging to another without the consent of the latter or by means of violence against or intimidation of persons or by use of force upon things. So what are the elements of anti-carnapping act? So the elements are actual taking of motor vehicle, the vehicle belongs to another, there is intent to gain in the taking of the vehicle of another, said taking, the said taking is without the consent of the owner or by means of violence, intimidation, or by means of force upon things. So, kung, hindi mo pwedeng sabihin na pag yung, uh, pag motor vehicle yung narob sa'yo, it is already under this law. Oh, so we, before we go here, I'll also discuss Article 311. So, it, it's theft of the property of the National Library and National Museum. So the value of the property is um, immaterial because the law prescribed the penalty of arrest to mayor or fine or both. So the moment na magnahaw ka sa National Library and sa National Museum, uh, immaterial na yung value ng property kasi uh, it is already under, it is already penalized automatically under this, um, this provision. So we go now to chapter four or usurpation. So it's Articles 312 to 313. So there are two acts punished under Article 312. So occupation of real property, which is committed by any person who, by means of violence against or intimidation, shall occupy the real property of another. And another is usurpation of real rights and property committed by any person who, by means of violence against or intimidation, shall usurp any real rights and property of another person. And Article 313 naman is altering boundaries or landmarks. So any person who shall alter the boundary marks or monuments of towns, provinces, or estates, or any other marks intended to designate the boundaries of the same shall be punished by arrest of menor or a fine not exceeding 100 pesos or both. So, di ba kanina, dun sa robbery, it said na um, kailangan personal property yung makuha sa'yo. Because if it is real property, it might fall under this article. So to further discuss it in a clearer manner, um, I'll give you an example. So what if there was a vacant, vacant plot? And here comes the ANCB uh, and his family. The said land or property was being guarded by X. So A and B went inside the... Va- so here comes A and B. Tapos, um, they went inside the vacant lot and tried to build a nipa house because wala silang bahay. So the guard told them that A and B has no right to build the Nipa house kasi yung land na yon kay Y yon. However, si A and B told the guard, the guard that wala naman kasi kaming bahay. So when nag-aaway na sila. So A and B killed the guard. So what is the crime committed here? It is under Article 312. The crime committed is occupation of real property and the killing is only a means to occupy the real property. It falls under violence against or intimidation of persons in occupying the real property. So next is Chapter 5, or culpable insolvency. And this includes Article 314, or fraudulent insolvency. And the penalty here is prison correctional to prison mayor. So it is any person who shall abscond with his property to the prejudice of his creditors shall suffer the penalty of prison mayor if he be a merchant and the penalty of prison correctional in its maximum period to prison mayor in its medium period if he be not a merchant. So ito connected din to sa mga napapag-aralan natin sa Oblipon na pag, um, pag yung debtor lolokohin niya yung creditor niya na mag na bigla na lang i-abscond niya yung property niya. So, it is also criminally, um, he might be criminally liable for this, under this article. So, next is chapter 6, or swindling and other deceits. Ito, makapakaba. So, it includes articles 315 to 318. 
So Article 315 is estafa. So we're there, there are three kinds of estafa. So the first is estafa with unfaithfulness or abuse of authority. Then the second one is estafa by means of false pretenses or fraudulent acts executed prior to or simultaneously with the commission of the crime. And the third is estafa through fraudulent means. So we go to the first one. Yung elements ng first one. Uh, ito po pala muna, sorry. So whatever the crime of estafa, alin man dun sa tatlo, there are always two general common elements. So ito yung dalawang pinaka-common na elements dun sa tatlo na yun. So that the offender defrauded another by reason of abuse of confidence or by means of deceit. So nang loko siya. Number two, um, so damage or prejudice capable of pecuniary estimation is caused to the offended party or to a third person. It does not necessarily mean na there must always be deceit. In lieu of deceit, estafa can be committed by by means of abuse of confidence. Tapos yung sa second naman, it is necessary that there must be damage or prejudice caused to the offended party or to a third person. The law requires that this damage or prejudice must be capable of pecuniary estimation because the penalty in estafa is dependent on the damage caused to the offended party. Hence, it is necessary that the said damage or prejudice must be capable of pecuniary estimation. You can estimate its value because the penalty is dependent on the value of the damage cost. So whatever the kind of estafa, there must always be the presence of these two elements. So we go now to the first one, or estafa with unfaithfulness or abuse of confidence. So my three punishable acts dito. The first one is by altering the substance, quantity, or quality, or anything of value which the offender shall deliver by virtue of an obligation to do. So even though such obligation be based on an immoral or illegal consideration. So, ibig sabihin, um, pag nang loko ka, kung wari, uh, magbibenta ka ng, nagbenta ka si A kay B ng 1,000 grams of shabu. Pero instead of 1,000 grams, um, or sabihin natin, um, 2 kilograms, tapos 1 kilogram of shabu lang yung binigay niya. So, it already falls here under this. Kasi kahit na illegal yung consideration, it, it can be charged with a staff act. So number two is by misappropriating or converting to the prejudice of another money, goods, or any other personal property received by the offender in trust or on commission or for administration or any or under any or any other under any obligation involving the duty to make delivery of or to return the same even even though such obligation be totally or partially grant, guaranteed by a bond or by denying having received such money goods or other property. So, ito, napaka-popular nito. It is necessary that the offender receive from the offended party money, goods, or personal property. So, when the said offender receives th such thing from the offended party, money, goods, or personal property, so, yung na-transfer sa kanya is yung juridical possession of the said property. So, if only yung material possession, yung na-transfer dun sa yung na-transfer sa offender and the offender misappropriated or or, na con or converted the same, the crime committed is only theft. So, or qualified theft, but not estafa. So, in order for the crime of estafa to arise, it is necessary that the offender has juridical possession of the money goods or the personal property. So, ano ba yung juridical possession? So, juridical possession is the possession in the concept of an owner. So, para kang nagiging owner. Ay, sorry. Yeah. So, para kang nagiging owner. It is a real right over the property during the time the property is in his possession. Nandun sa possession offender. He has better right even than that of the owner of the said property. So, talagang may karapatan siya dun sa property. Tapos, pag na-misappropriate niya yun, he may fall under estafa. Pero kung yung personal right lang, um, pwedeng theft or qualified theft as the case may be. So the third one naman is by taking undue advantage of the signature of the offended party in blank and by writing any document above such signature in blank to the prejudice of the offended party or of any third person. Okay. So to give you an example, so what if A rented the gown from the shop of B? A will use the gown for an event we not in prom and the rental fee is 1,000 pesos exclusive of dry cleaning. The gown was due, um, it was due to be returned two days after the event. 
Tapos, it has been a week since the event and B demanded the return of the gown. A did not return the same. Can B file a case of estafa against A? So the answer here is yes. Because estafa is, a, is the crime committed by A because when B loaned the gown to A, it was based on a contract of lease in which juridical possession had been transferred from B to A. Um, a, while the gown is with her, has juridical possession over it, meaning A has better right to the property than B, the owner thereof. So when A failed to return the gown, then she committed the staffa. So another example of this, yung pag bumare, um, nag-rent kayo, nag kayo ng bikes, for example, sa dati, nung bata kami sa may luneta, ganyan, nag-rent ka ng bikes, sabihin natin ng one hour or three hours, tapos kawari hindi mo nasol yung bike. You, um, you are transferred juridical possession for those three hours. So pag hindi mo nasol yun in those time, in, in three hours, pwede kang kasuhan ng estafa. So one other example, the, money, the manager of a company has a blank document which contains only a signature. The manager gave it to the secretary and told the secretary to use the document for emergency purposes. When, this, when, the, man, when the manager left, the secretary wrote in the document stating that the manager will pay for her credit card bills. Nakakaloka si secretary. So what crime is committed by the secretary? So here, the crime committed is estafa. So this falls under the third, um, the third act to be punished. This is because the manager entrusted to the secretary the document in blank, which contains his signature. And the secretary wrote therein above the signature to the prejudice of the manager because the manager now nag na siya ng obligation, which is to pay for the credit card bills. So the crime committed by the secretary is estafa. So you only have to choose between estafa and falsification of a private document. But you can never complex yung estafa with um, estafa by um, by falsification of a private document. Kasi walang crime na estafa through falsification of a private, sorry, public, private document. Pero may estafa through falsification of a public document. We often hear this. But remember that there is no such thing as estafa through falsification of a private one. So, in estafa, through falsification of a public document, damage is not an element. So, in a deed of absolute sale, tas na falsify ito in order to deceive another um, in the crime of estafa, para estafa niya, it will give rise to the complex crime of estafa through falsification of a public document. Estafa through falsification of a public, um, through a public document, kasi here, yung deed of absolute sale is a commercial document. So, here naman, since this is a malaprohibitum law, in, um, damage is not an element. So, yeah, there. Hmm? Estafa by means of false pretenses or fraudulent acts executed prior to or simultaneously with the commission of the fraud. So there are five punishable acts here. So the first is by using fictitious name or falsely pretending to possess power, influence, qualifications, property, credit, agency, business, or imaginary transactions, or by means of other deceits. So, nagpapanggap ka na uh, may kakayahan ka gawin yung, gawin yung isang bagay when in reality, wala naman. Second is by altering the quality, fitness, or way of anything pertaining to his art or business. Third is um, by pretending, pretending to have bribed the government employee. Fourth is by post-dating a check or issuing a check in payment of an obligation when the offender had no funds in the bank or his funds deposited therein were not sufficient to cover the amount of the check. So, um, in this kind naman, pwede rin siyang under BP-22 eh. Kasi yung bouncing checks law, it's also post-dating a check tapos walang laman yung, ano, walang laman yung bank. And it, 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 it is also um, it is also punishable by law. So in this kind of stuff, in this kind of stuff, so the fourth one, it is necessary that the issuance of the check must be in committance with the defra defraudation. So I discussed in another video the indifference nila is my um my element ng my element ng damage dun sa, damage and deceit kay estafa, which is hindi naman kailangan kay BP twenty two. Kasi wala namang element ng damage and deceit doon. So here, 
yung pag-issue niya ng check is um, to commit fraud. While in BP22 naman, it's post-dating a check, tapos subsequently knowing na walang laman yung bank. So we, you really have to um, grasp their difference kasi medyo nakakalito sila. But remember na deceit and damage is um, is an element of estafa in post-dating a check. So in this kind of estafa, it is necessary that the issuance of the check must be in concomitance with the depredations, like I said. Because note that Article 315 says that estafa by means of false pretenses or fraudulent acts exerted prior to or simultaneously with the commission of the fraud, therefore, it is necessary that the issuance of the check is in concomitance with the depredation. That is, the offender would not have parted with his property would it not for the promise that the check would be funded. So yung exchange dito, hindi, naman, hindi niya naman maluloko yung, per si, yung person kung hindi um kung hindi niya alam na kung alam niya na wala namang laman yung check so the person is given a period of three days to make good the check if the offender failed to make good the check it is said to be a prima facie evidence of deceit constituting the fraudulent act or false pretenses diba sa bp22 i think it takes um it takes five days from the written na notice na kailangan mapondohan yung check here in um in estafa in post dating estafa, in post dating checks in estafa three days lang and lastly yung sa five punishable acts by obtaining any food refreshment or accommodation at a hotel in restaurant boarding house lodging house or apartment house and the like without paying therefore with intent to defraud the pr proprietor or manager thereof, or by obtaining credit at the hotel in restaurant, boarding house, lodging house, or apartment house, by the use of any false pretense, or by abandoning or surreptitiously removing any part of this baggage from a hotel in restaurant, boarding house, lodging house, or apartment house, after obtaining credit, food, refreshment, or accommodation therein, without paying for his food, refreshment, or accommodation. So, pag nang loko, pag nag check in ka tapos, bigla kang dumakas ganun. So, estafa rin yun. So the offender went to a hotel or in to obtain food refreshment or accommodation tapos hindi siya nagbayad or nag-obtain siya ng credit tapos yung goods, yung mga damit niya, yung luggage na nasa loob pa, tapos umalis lang siya. So it, is, it still falls under this. So to give you an example, what if A was buying one sack of jasmine rice in the market and the vendor put three-fourths of jasmine rice and one-fourth of NFA rice? What crime was committed? So here, the crime committed is estafa by altering the quality, fitness, or weighing of anything pertaining to his art or business. He alters the weight of the apple, uh, sorry, malian, of the of the rice which pertains to his business, and therefore he can be held liable for estafa under Article Three One Five, Paragraph Two B. So another is what if A, B, and C are licensed teachers? and wanted to teach English in Korea. Anyong. X approached the three, the three, saying he has a recruitment and placement agency and will help them find work and process their paper. So A, B, and C agreed and paid 100K each for processing fees. Thereafter, hindi na nila ulit nakita si X. So what is the crime committed by X? So A, B, and C can file two cases against X. Estafa under Article 315 and illegal recruitment in a large scale under the Labor Code. These two are cumulative and not exclusive of each other. Hence, the offender can be charged of these two crimes at the same time. Estafa under Article 315 is committed because X misrepresented to them that he has the qualification and the agency to bring them to work in another country when in fact he does not have the qualification and agency, where it is not for if it is not for the said misrepresentation by X, the offended parties A, B, and C would not have parted with the said 100,000 pesos in cash. So the other crime committed by X is illegal recruitment in a large scale. So na discussed into in another video, um, discussing labor, labor court. So if illegal recruitment is committed against three or more persons, um, individually or as a whole, it is considered as illegal recruitment in large scale. So, sinabi doon na as soon as tatlo na yung na-victimize mo into illegal recruitment. 
considered na yun in a large scale. So on the other hand, if it is committed by five or more persons, it is con it is considered as syndicated illegal recruitment. So kung, kung si X1, si X, Y, Z, um, G, B, yung nag-commit, ano na sila, committed na sila na syndicated illegal recruitment. Both crimes are considered crimes involving economic sabotage under the labor code and is the reason why it is not an why it is a non-bailable offense. So non-bailable offense to okay. Okay. So the last one is estafa through fraudulent means. So my three punishable acts in here. So one is by inducing another by means of deceit to sign any document. And um, another is by resorting to some fraudulent practice to ensure success in a gambling game. And lastly is by removing, concealing, or destroying in whole or in part any court record, office files, document, or any other papers. So in the first one, merong case na there was this Japanese son-in-law and in asking yung mother and kumar si A, Japanese son-in-law, in asking yung mother-in-law niya si B to sign a document. So in-induce niya si ano, si induce niya si B into signing the document saying na it's about taxes, it's about yung pension, ganyan. But in truth and fact, a uh, special power of attorney to for the sale and pro for the sale of um of the property of the of B in Tagaytay. So yung mother-in-law na to matanda na nga, medyo bulag-bulag na bingin na. So pinirmahan niya, pinirmahan ni B. So yung si A was able to sell to sell the said property. So this is the kind of estafa by um inducing another by means of deceit to sign a document. So by resorting to so, yung sa pangalawa naman um sa pangalawa naman for example merong sabong cockbite so the offender removed the thing the thing of the feet the thing on the feet of the rooster and so by reason thereof nanalo siya dun sa game so it falls under estafa on this second act punished tapos yung sa third naman it um i think it's self explanatory na by removing concealing or destroying in whole or in part any court record office files document or any other papers pero note dun sa first um first example that um that i gave dun sa a and b na son in law kasi it there later it will be discussed na there are those who are not liable for those who are not liable for the deceits, like for theft, I think theft, estafa, and malicious mischief. But here, kasi, it says there na um, they, this can be liable because it is not simple estafa. And it should fall under this article. It will be discussed later, though. So, Article 316 is other forms of swindling. So, other forms of swindling can be committed by the following. So, it's any person who, pretending to be the owner of the, any real property, shall convey, sell, encumber, or mortgage the same. Any person who, knowing that the real property is encumbered, shall dispose of the same, although such encumbrance be not recorded. The owner of any personal property who shall wrongfully take it from its lawful possessor, to the prejudice of the latter or any third person. Any person who, to the prejudice of another, shall execute any fictitious contract. Then any person who shall accept any compensation given to him under the belief that it was in the payment of services rendered or labor performed by him when in fact he did not actually perform such services or labor and any person who while being assured in a assured in a bond given in a criminal or civil action without express authority of for, from the court or before the cancellation of his of his bond or before being re relieved from the obligation contracted by him shall sell mortgage or in any other manner encumber the real property or properties which with which he guaranteed the fulfillment of such an obligation. So note that these are the other forms of swindling. So I'll give you an example. What if A is a debtor and in order to defraud his creditor, A as the debtor has an obligation which is due and demandable. So he has only one property, a property in Pleasant City, which can be attached by his creditor. So if you want to add that, it's all before. Now, in order to defraud his creditor, he ex he executed a fictitious contract selling the said property to B with the intention to defraud his creditor. So what is the crime committed by A? 
So, A is liable of other forms of swindling under Article 316 because the contract that he executed in favor of B is only a fictitious contract. It is not a real contract of sale conveying his property to B. So, yung, basta pag nakita yung fictitious contract, it falls under Article 316 kasi part siya dun sa mga um, acts to be punished under other forms of swindling. So, another is what if A is a debtor and in order to defraud his creditor, A has a debt. He has a debtor and has an obligation to do in the mandible. So it's the same problem. So here naman, to the fraudist creditor, what he did was, was he, so, he sold the property, yung property niya sa QC, he sold the property to B via a deed of absolute sale. So his intention was still to defraud, to defraud the creditor. So what crime is committed naman here? Is it still under Article 316 and other forms of swindling? So here, it is... Um, under Article 314, the one we discussed a while ago. So A committed fraudulent insolvency. The contract is a real transfer of property from A to B. It is not a fictitious contract. So pag fictitious contract, unaan po natin under Article siya ng 316. If it is not, tapos ito ang contract of sale siya, it is fraudulent insolvency under Article 314. So ito naman yung iba pa na under this chapter still on swindling, it's swindling a minor. So who is liable here? Any person who taking advantage of, of the inexperience or emotions or feelings of a minor to his detriment shall induce him to assume any obligation or to give any release or execute any transfer of any property right in consideration of some loan or money, credit, or other personal property, whether the loan clearly appears in the document or is shown in any other form. So yung pangloloko ng mga minors is also um, penalized under this article. And under Article 318, other deceits. So who are liable here? Any person who, for profit or for gain, shall interpret dreams, make forecasts, tell fortunes, or take advantage of the credulity of the public in any other similar manner. So if the offender commits any of the acts of swindling and any act of deprivation not punishable under Articles 315, 316, and 317, it is punishable under Article 318, which is other deceits. So any other form of deprivation would be under, under Article 318. So, paano si Madam Auring? Di ba, manguhula siya. She tells fortune, what if, um, kung wari si A, pumunta siya kay, kay Madam Auring, tapos sinabi ni Madam Auring, oh, um, magkaka-cancer ka by the age of 30 and you will die by the age of 32. So because of this, si A, hindi na makatulog kasi sobrang na-depress siya. So, um, sobrang na-depress siya tapos lagi niya iniisip na mamamatay na siya. So, can A file a case against Madam Auring under Article 318? So the answer is yes. He can file a case of other deceits under Madam, against Madam Auring kasi for profit or gain, kaya sinabi yun yung Madam Auring and tells his fortune, which is hindi naman talaga um, reliable or law or lawful kasi who can predict someone's death naman talaga? So how can someone predict so when someone will be um, will be famous or earn money or um, fortune or ill luck? Alin man dyan, hindi naman pwede ma-predict yun ng tao. So magic is not really... Um, recognized by our laws and obviously it is done in order to defraud CA and 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 na damage CA kasi hindi na nga siya makatulog kasi nagka depression siya so definitely he can file for a case against Madam Audrey so next is article 319 removal sale or pledge of mortgage property so what are the acts punishable here so any person who shall knowingly remove any personal property mortgage under the Chat the Chatel mortgage Gage law to any province or city other than the one in which it was located at the time of the execution of the mortgage without the written consent of the mortgagee or his executors, administrators, or assigns any mortgager who shall sell or pledge personal property already pledged or any part thereof under the terms of the Chatel mortgage law without the consent of the mortgagee with written in the back of the mortgage and noted on the record hereof in the office of the register register of deeds uh, of the province where such property is located. So next is chapter 8 and it is arson and other crimes involving destructions. So this includes articles 
320PD1613, Articles 327 to Articles 331. So, yung ano kasi, yung una, Articles 322, 326, speaks of arson. So, these are already repealed by Presidential Decree 1613 or the Law on Arson. Pero, yung Article 320 to 326, kahit na, na, ano na siya, na-repeal na siya, yung Article 20, 320 has been brought back into light by RA 7659. That is why, in so far as um, in so far as Article 320 is concerned, the crime of destructive arson is still penalized under Article 320. So, sa PD 1613 naman, it punishes simple arson or other cases of arson. So, hindi natin iko consider yung Section 2 ng PD 1613 which punishes destructive arson kasi nga, yung destructive arson, punishable siya under Article 320. So, destructive, um, there are two kinds of arson. So, first one so is destructive arson. Kaya nga nang sinabi ko, it's punished under Article 320. And simple arson, punished under 1613. So, what is arson ba? Arson is the malicious destruction of the property by means of fire. So first, we discuss destructive arson. So how is destructive arson committed? So ito yung mga enumeration niya. If one or more buildings or edifices um, consequent to one single act of burning or as a result of simultaneous burnings or committed on several or different occasions, any building or of public or private ownership devoted to public in general or where people usually gather or congregate for a definite purpose such as but not limited to an official government function or business, private transaction, commerce, trade, wor trade workshop, meetings, conferences, or merely incidental to or for a definite purpose such as but not limited to motels, transients, dwellings, um, public conveyances or stops or terminals regardless, regardless of whether the offender had knowledge that there are persons in the said building or edifice at the time set that he set it on fire and regardless of whether the building is actually inhabited or not. So third is any train, locomotive, ship or vessel, airship or airplane devoted to transportation or conveyance or for public use, entertainment and leisure. Fourth is any building, factory, warehouse, in installation and other upper appurtenances <laughs> thereto which are devoted to the service of the public utilities. And fifth is any building, um, the burning of which is for the purpose of concealing or destroying the evidence or of another violation of law or for the purpose of concealing bankruptcy or defrauding creditors or to collect from insurance. So there's also this destructive arson when the arson is committed by two or more persons, regardless of whether their purpose is to merely um, burn or destroy the building or the burning merely constitutes as an overt act in the commission of another violation of the law. So another is when the, any person shall burn any arsenal, shipyard, um, storehouse, military power, or fireworks factory, ordinance, storehouse, um, archives, or general museum of the government, or in an inhabited place, any storehouse or factory of inflammable or explosive materials. So how about anti-arson law or PD 1613? So simple arson or other cases of arson is committed if what has been burned is any building used as offices of the government or any of its agencies, any inhabited house or dwelling, and any industrial establishment, shipyard, oil well, or mine shaft, platform, or tunnel, any plantation, farm, pasture, land, growing crop, grain field, or orchard, bamboo grove or forest, any rice mill, sugar mill, cane mill or mill central, any railway or bus station, airport, wharf or warehouse. So the penalty for destructive arson is reclusion perpetua to death. If as a result of the commission of any of the acts of destructive arson, death results and the penalty should be death. It, so the penalty naman for simple arson, reclusion temporal to reclusion perpetua, so under Section 5 of PD 1613, if by reason or location of simple arson, death results, the penalty is reclusion perpetua to death. 
So we have the problem. What if in the course of the commission of the destructive arson, someone died? The airplane was burned. The purpose was to burn the said airplane. Unknown to the offender, someone was inside the said airplane and the said person died. What crime is committed by the offender? So here, the offender is um, liable for destructive arson under Article 320. The fact that someone died will not give rise to a complex crime. The crime committed is only arson. So na absorb na dito yung murder. After the last paragraph of Article 320, it is stated that if as a consequence of the commission of any of the acts constituting arson, death results, then the mandatory penalty of death shall be imposed. So here, the fact that someone died in the course of the commission of destruct destructive arson would mean that the penalty to be imposed of the said offender would be death. But the, but the crime um, committed is only arson. There is no such thing as arson with homicide. So another is, what if A went inside the house of B and then he saw B and shot B with a gun and so C B na matay? Thereafter, to conceal the killing of B, A burned the house of B. What crime is committed? So dito naman, A committed two crimes. So the first is murder for killing B uh, treacherously and arson because he burned the house of B in order to conceal the commission of the said act of the killing. The arson is commit the arson committed is simple arson. So my frustrated arson ba? There is no such crime as frustrated arson. I forget lang yung uh, title ng case, but it explained there na parang when um when two offenders was trying to burn the house and what they, what what they only burned was I think rags. So wala pang nababurn kahit yung sahig or yung wall ng house. So the they said na dapat frustrated arson lang. And I think I think the Supreme Court ruled there that there is no crime such as frustrated arson. There is only attempted arson. Um, because wala pa namang, wala pa naman, hindi pa nila na-achieve yung purpose nila. Wala, pa, wala pang kahit ano dun sa bahay na gusto nilang i-burn, yung nag-burn. So to discuss further, the moment any part of the said structure or building is burned, arson is already consummated. If no part of the said structure or building is burning, it is only attempted arson, like what I said in the example. There cannot be a circumstance of frustrated arson because how is a crime a frustrated felony? Diba a frustrated felony is committed when the offender has performed all the acts of execution that would produce the felony as a consequence. Nevertheless, the felony is not produced by reason of the causes independent of the will of the perpetrator. So the offender na perform niya na all the acts of the ex execution of the crime of arson. But for the offender to be said that he has performed all the acts of execution, it is necessary that the building or the property has already been burned. Otherwise, it cannot be said that he has perform performed all the acts of execution. So by definition talaga, hindi mo masasabing frustrated yung felony kasi nga in arson, as soon as may kahit mas, mas small na part nang yung burn, it's already consummated. So, ayun. So, walang frustrated arson. Next. So, next article is Article 327 or malicious mischief. So, who are liable for malicious mischief? So, any person who shall deliberately cause the property of another uh, um, any damage not falling within the terms for, from the next preceding chapter shall be guilty of malicious mischief. So what is malicious mischief? It is the willful damaging of another's property for the sake of causing damage due to hate, revenge, or evil motive. If the, in the intention of the offender is to cause damage in the property of another by any means outside of arson, is malicious mischief. It is a crime which can only be committed by means of intent. There must be deliberate intent to cause damage to the property of another because if there is no intent to cause damage in the property, the liability will be damages only. Civil liability and hindi siya criminal liability. In order for a crime to be considered malicious mischief, it is necessary that there is deliberate intent to cause damage to the property of another. Absent that deliberate intent to damage the to injure the property of another, it cannot be considered malicious mischief like what we said. The said offender will only be liable for damages, for causing damage to the property of another, civil liability and not criminal liability. Or if there is was negligence, imprudence on his part, it would be reckless imprudence or simple negligence causing damage to property. But for malicious mischief to arise, it is necessary na may intent nga siya. So, ayun. 
So next is special cases of malicious mischief or qualified malicious mischief. So when is the penalty qualified? So one is when causing damage to obstruct the performance of public functions. Number two is using poisonous or corrosive substances. Number three is spreading any infection or contagion among cattle. Number four, causing damage to the property of the National Library or to any, to any archive or registry, waterworks, road, promenade, or any other thing used in common by public. And Article 329 speaks of other mischiefs, which includes other damage would constitute ordinary malicious mischief. The mischiefs not included in the next preceding article. So yung mga hindi included sa kakasabi ko lang. And Article 330 is damage and obstruction to means of communication. So what is punished in is the damage and obstruction to means of communication. So sino yung liable dito? So the penalty of prison correctional and its medium and maximum periods shall be imposed upon any person who shall damage any railway, telegraph, or telephone lines. If the damage shall result in any derailment of cars, collision, in any or other accident, the penalty is qualified to prison mayor without prejudice to the criminal liability of the offender for the other consequences of his criminal act. For the purpose of the for the purpose of the provisions of the article, the electric wires, traction cables, signal system, and other things pertaining to railways shall be deemed to constitute an integral part of the railway system. And lastly, Article three three one is destroying or damaging stat statutes, statutes, statues rather, sorry, puro batas, public monuments or paintings. So, sino yung liable dito? Any person who shall destroy or damage statues or any other useful or ornamental public monument. So, the penalty of arrest to mayor in its medium period to prison correctional in its minimum period. If what has been damaged are only private monuments or private paintings, it is only ordinary malicious mischief. So any person who shall destroy or damage any useful or ornamental painting of a public nature shall suffer the penalty of arrest to minor or a fine not exceeding 200 pesos or both such fine and imprisonment in the discretion of the court. So ito na yung sinabi ko kanilang mga exemptions. So chapter 10 is exemption from criminal liability in crimes against property. So article 332 is persons exempt from criminal liability. So, no criminal, but only civil liability shall result from the commission of the crime of theft, swindling, or estafa, or malicious mischief committed or caused mutually by the following persons. So, spouses, ascendants, descendants, or relatives by affinity in the same line. The widowed spouse with respect to the property which belonged to the deceased spouse before the same shall have passed into the possession of another, and brothers and sisters brothers and sisters, and brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law, if li living together. So, the exemption established by this article shall not be applicable to strangers participating in the commission of the crime. This exempting circumstance will not apply to strangers. If the strangers connive with any of the persons mentioned in, an article, in this article, um, the stranger is liable. Only the enumerated persons is not criminally liable. So, yung case nga kanina dun kay A and B na yung son-in-law, niloko niya yung mother-in-law niya into signing a document na pumaya for taxes, but yun pala for the sale of property. Um, uh, the Supreme Court said, this absolutory cause or exempting circumstance applies exclusively to simple crimes of theft, swindling, and malicious mischief. The exemption under Article 332 will not arise. It will not absorb the offender if the crime committed is a complex crime. So, naalala nyo kanina, di ba, yung sabi ko nga, yung um, yung falsification of a public document since ano yun, since yung yung deed of sale is a public document and yung falsification nun. So, yung magiging crime ni A dun, na pang naloko dun sa mother-in-law niya, is a staff ah, through falsification of a public document. So, it is a complex crime. So, hindi siya simple staff ah. So, ano sabi ng Supreme Court dito? Because the special power of attorney was falsified. Since the crime was um, estafa through falsification of a public document, the Supreme Court said the son-in-law can be held criminally liable. So this apply only to simple cases of estafa. So, ano, the relationship by affinity is still existing, by the way. Kasi diba, sinabi na, um, actually in this case, yung asawa ni A, 
ko si A, yung asawa niya is yung yung asawa niya which is yung anak ng mother-in-law is already dead. So the relationship by affinity is still existing. The purpose is to ensure harmony with the family. Article 332 will still apply kahit napatay na yung wife. So the son-in-law but here nga since special complex crime yung nilabag niya criminally liable siya. So the crime committed is complex crime of estafa through falsification of a public document. Hence, he should be liable. Based on jurisprudence, the word spouses include paramours and, with, and mistresses and other wives. So, for example, you're a Muslim and you have um, four other wives. So, kasama sila dito based on jurisprudence. So, kasama din yung mga kabit and yung mga mistresses. The word ascendants include um, stepfather and stepmother. The word descendants includes stepchildren, adopted children, and natural children. So the reason is that the exempting circumstance, the absolutory cause under um, Article 332, is made in order to ensure harmony within the family. So, ayon. so thank you for listening. This was Title 10 or Crimes Against Property. It was a pretty long discussion. I hope um, you learned something from this video. And sorry kung again may mga mali akong nasabi or na-explain, please correct me if I'm wrong. But I hope it was um, an educational video. And I'll still be uploading the next um, the next chapters or the next titles if I have time. And I hope this helped your exam. Thank you for listening.